On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, the dual motor Model 3 gets a significant speed boost if you're willing to pay to unlock it. Plus, Time Magazine honors the Model S, Model 3 dominates the sales charts in 2019, and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Welcome to episode 229 of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast for December 22nd, 2019. Daisy the Boxer Puppy is behind me, currently rearranging the blankets in her crate, so she's awake for now. We'll see how long that lasts in the podcast. Anyway, uh, next week, as I said on the end of last week's show, I will be here. There's no, you know, I don't take time off from this podcast, and on the rare occasion I do, I do give you uh, something to listen to that week, but I'll be here with regular new quote-unquote live regular shows uh, for the holidays. I am doing a little bit of traveling, but nothing that will prevent me from doing a podcast, but I will say I do need to do the show a little early the next couple weeks just because of my travel dates, uh, meaning on Thursday, so if it so works out that I happen to miss anything, I apologize, and I'll, of course, as always, pick that up on the following week's show. But yeah, I will be traveling to and fro uh, the next couple Fridays between San Francisco and Phoenix. So if you're along those routes, you know, San Francisco to Phoenix or just even L.A. to Phoenix uh, on, <laughs> on on either of the next couple Fridays, well, maybe we'll run into each other at a supercharger, and if you happen to see me, please do say hello. I'll be the guy with the uh, the dog in the car with me. But looking forward to the trip, just fingers crossed that I have an uneventful trip. You know, no no damage to the car, no road hazards, no tire problems, hopefully no law enforcement problems or anything like that. But uh, yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting because... Uh, Navigate on autopilot was there last year. Uh, this year it's got the you know auto lane change, though I have that turned off. And then let's see, what else is new this year? Well, the I guess the big one as far as this trip goes is uh, when I did this trip last year, there was no Netflix in the car. So that'll be a good one, especially with my eight-year-old with me uh, for those charging stops. But safe travels to all of you if you are uh, riding somewhere in your Tesla over the holidays, or even certainly if you're traveling by airline as well. I wish you a safe uh, and pleasant holiday travel season. Okay, uh, let's get started. The big news this week the Model 3's long-range dual-motor variant, now that this is the non-performance version, uh, has just received an optional paid upgrade for a speed boost. If you want to go faster, it is there for you in a pay-to-play format. $2,000 will get you half a second quicker from 0 to 60, going from the 4.4 seconds that it's at now, and they'll slip you just under 4 seconds down to 3.9 seconds. So that's still... Where Tesla's setting that up, that still keeps it pretty good ways away from the performance version, which now sits at 3.1 seconds. In fact, the more I kind of thought about it, the more I figured, well, this was probably calculated very specifically by Tesla to be enough of a speed boost, enough of a, a jump to make sure that you feel it if you choose to pay for it. You'll feel the difference. In fact, uh, on the Tesla Motors Reddit, People that are electing to spend it, spend the money for that, are saying, "Yeah, you you know, you can definitely feel it." But I imagine that it's it's enough to feel it, but not enough to encroach on performance Model Three sales, because you know it's a it's a you know it's a reasonable two thousand dollar difference from the regular long range dual motor price. You know, it's not the the full step up to to performance in the price departments, and then of course it's not the full step up performance wise but you know regardless this is a i mean this is a pretty substantial power boost for what i think is a pretty reasonable price it more or less splits the difference between the dual motor and the performance that said i'll tell you if i had the regular dual motor 
I would jump at this instantaneously. I would have had my wallet open <laughs> right away. Um, although I'll say this right now, if Tesla did offer a similar thing for the performance Model 3s, if there was an upgrade there that could take me down to, say, 2.8 seconds, you know, give me a three, four tenths, I would, I would pay that same couple grand. That would, be, that would be super worth it to me to get that extra, extra roller coaster effect. So who knows if, uh, I, it, it all depends probably on where the performance model three is, is set as far as where it's safe, uh, as far as the long-term reliability of the components of the car, the parts of the car to, to, uh, you know, have that performance dialed into. But, you know, I, I also have to notice that whether by a, a careful plan or whether by sheer coincidence, the timing of this of this power boost is right in the holiday gift giving season and also coincidentally right before the end of the quarter so um again so whether that's just a, a happy coincidence or or a careful plan you know it's it's really uh, something that should help nudge tesla either into the black hopefully for q4 or uh, even better would be further into it if they're already going to be there anyway. I mean, I, I, so I was thinking more about this when I was walking Daisy the other day. I don't know how many dual motor cars there are. We, the best data we have to go off of is the sample size from the Bloomberg uh, 5000 owner survey that they did. I talked about it on this podcast What about maybe that must have been a month and a half, two months ago now. And the, the divide was, you know, there was about, it was about a, between a third of, of the fleet, at least, uh, well, the third of the sample size and maybe a little bit more than that. So let's say a quarter of the Model 3 fleet is the dual motor variant, non-performance. And that's, that's just a ballpark guess. You know, of course, the first year of production was just long range rear wheel drive. And it's been since then that the, the dual motors have come out, but all right. But, but also that's when production ramped way up too. So uh, let's just call it a quarter of it for the sake of argument. And let's say, so there's around six, you know, five, 600,000 model threes with what we know the production was last year, the little bit from 2017 to 2018, and then the, the, the year so far this year. So let's just call it 600,000 model threes total. So 150,000, dual motor Model 3s that are eligible for this paid upgrade. Of those, I would imagine that only the enthusiasts like me uh, would really want to go for this. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's 10% of, of the 150,000 dual motor cars. That's still 15,000 people. If they pay $2,000 each, that's $30 million. So not insignificant. Now, I acknowledge completely here, I'm probably not even close in my guess, but it's food for thought. It's a good thought exercise. Now, final point on this topic. Some people have expressed concern that this could be a, the start of a slippery slope at Tesla, that the Tesla could start holding back on their cars on purpose with the idea of doing this kind of paid DLC, if you're familiar with the video game wor uh, world, uh, DLC, downloadable content, you know, this sort of, these sort of paid upgrades and just baking them into the, to the car roadmap down the road that, as we know, costs Tesla nothing. This, these upgrades cost Tesla zero to perform on the, uh, on the dual motor Model 3s that want it. And, and I'll say this. I think it's a fair concern. It is a very, very fair concern. But my take on it is as follows. And it's something that you have heard me say before if you've been listening to this podcast for any uh, length of time. And that is this. Until Tesla proves that they no longer deserve the benefit of the doubt, I think they do deserve the benefit of the doubt, at least for me, because I think they have earned it over time. You know, I, and I completely understand and respect if you don't agree with that, but time and time again, we have seen Tesla act in a way that is both upstanding and in the customer's interest. Not every single time, they're not perfect, but most of the time, 
in my humble opinion, Tesla has acted honorably. So we have to hope that this is not something that's going to become part of the regular product roadmap, that they're just going to start you know, locking, locking off uh, a bit that they know they could put in there just to charge more for it as, as uh, you know, an optional upgrade later. So we'll see what happens as time goes on, but I am personally not concerned about that as of now. Speaking of software unlocks, the standard range plus Model 3s, as one of the, those cars' software locked limitations, they do not have the heated rear seats enabled, even though the hardware is actually there. And that, it seems, might be changing soon as another paid upgrade. A Twitter user by the name of Andrew Carney tweeted at Elon saying, quote, any chance for a cold weather over the air paid upgrade to activate the rear heated seats? To which Elon did reply simply saying, sure. So uh, Elon left that one pretty vague. You know, is it going to be paid like Andrews did specifically ask? And if so, how much would that cost? Thinking about it, the number that comes to mind in my head, 500 bucks. I think 500's fair. I think 1,000 would be a little much on that, just personally. 500 would be fair. I think you'd get a lot of takers on that. So that's my guess. And then we're also left to wonder, well, okay, if this does happen, when might this happen? We're officially in winter now. Now that uh, you know this show's airing on the 22nd, winter has officially just begun. But yeah, no idea when this might happen. Elon, pretty vague in his reply, but he does acknowledge that this is a thing that is, at, at the very least, now on his radar. So... Um, I would, here's how I would look at this. If you're a standard range plus owner who would like to enable those second row seat heaters, I wouldn't hold my breath, uh, just because, because Elon really did not offer a lot of, of clarity or definition there. I just, I wouldn't hold my breath. If it does happen, great. You know, we're heading into winter, so sooner would be better for a lot of people, but there's just not a lot to go on with Elon's reply, just the acknowledgement that it is now being considered. But still, I do, I definitely hope it happens because, as I said, it's, it's wintertime's officially on. There are a few cold months ahead for a lot of folks, and there are probably plenty of people that would go ahead and take Tesla up on this should they uh, elect to make that feature available. More good stuff here. Time Magazine, still one of the most respected publications in America, uh, has named the Model S one of the 10 best gadgets of the decade. Actually, technically, they call it their, it's one of the most, ten, the 10 most important gadgets of the decade. Uh, get this, their, it's, their headline on the story, when I went and looked at it, their headline is 10 best, but then the first line of the story it specifically says most important. So uh, they're going off of influence and impact and not just stuff that's good. And what I can tell you, having re having to read this a couple times, because the again, the, the headline is at odds with the first line of the story. I would imagine that speaking as a website editor myself, I'm pretty sure I know what time was doing there. They were using best as an SEO play for Google. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The list, if you're curious, aside from the Model S, and, and by the way, this does not seem to be in any sort of ranked order, but the list is iPad, the Raspberry Pi, Google Chromecast, the DJI Phantom Drone, the Amazon Echo, the Apple Watch, Apple AirPods, the Nintendo Switch, the Microsoft Adaptive Controller, and the Tesla Model S. If you're curious, here's what they said about the Model S. Quote, think cars can't be gadgets? Then you haven't driven a Tesla Model S or watched one drive up to you. The electric sedan has slowly reshaped the trajectory of the automotive industry, forcing competitors to embrace a battery-powered future instead of the gas-guzzling present and challenging the belief that electric cars can't be cool. Features like downloadable software updates, a huge touchscreen display, and advanced autopilot capabilities make it feel like a vehicle from 2022 instead of 2012. Think of the Tesla Model S as the iPod of cars, if your iPod could do 0 to 60 in 2.3 seconds. 
end quote. So you want to know what's a bit funny to me about that write-up is that I more or less said the same thing in my review of the Model S P85, for I, which I did for IGN in May of 2013, six and a half years ago, well before I started this podcast. In fact, here is that here is a clip from my own video review of the Model S that I did uh, for IGN back in 2013. Outside of your indispensable smartphone, the Model S is the best piece of technology you could possibly have in your daily life, if you can afford its $63,570 base price. And I say that knowing, frighteningly, that this is only a 1.0 version. Remember the original iPhone? People called it the Jesus phone and happily paid its $600 asking price. Today we pay half that for the latest Apple phone, and you'd probably laugh out loud if you picked up a first-generation iPhone again. If Tesla makes similar advances in both technology and price reduction, and they've already said they hope to have a mid-size $30,000 sedan out in about three to four years, then the automotive world is going to be a much better place very soon. Well, for us anyway. Not so much for other automakers. Wow, you know what's crazy about that? I hadn't listened to that in a long time, but the, the, the time write-up just made me think of it. All of that happened. Everything that I said happened. And by the way, just to super duper clarify, not that any of you are thinking this, but I'm in no way accusing time of lifting anything from me. It's just, it's a pretty similar sentiment. It's not any sort of like word for word thing, but I just think it's, it's very interesting that what I said about the Model S back then, you know, not the most original thought on the planet, but that's how I <laughs> summed it up that that still resonates as a common sentiment six and a half years later. That's how good and how impactful and how important the Model S was and is. But anyway, uh, good on Time Magazine for recognizing Tesla here. I mean, honestly, they could have gone with the Model 3 and made an equally compelling case for it to be on the list, but... They are certainly very much justified in choosing the S, as of course neither the three nor the t nor Tesla itself would still exist without the Model S. Uh, side note: How many of those ten products on their list do you own? No need to call in or email or anything. It's just a thought exercise because I was reading it, going, "Well, let's see here. Uh, I've got three of them since I have a Model Three and not a Model S." I've got the Switch and the Apple Watch, uh, and then, um, well, I guess, what was the third one? The Switch, the Apple Watch, oh, and the AirPods, which I, I, and I love all three of those. They're all great, but, you know, I guess only three out of ten, I guess my nerd cred takes a little bit of a hit today. Next up this week, Clean Technica estimates, based on some existing sales data, that the Model 3 is the ninth best-selling car in the United States in 2019. Now, that's not mid-size sedan, not luxury car, not electric car, just car, car, period. But uh, true, the one, it, the one thing is it doesn't include trucks as they're in their own class, but they've got, Clean Technica's got the list at Camry, Civic, Corolla, Accord, Altima, Sentra, Fusion, Elantra, and the Model 3. Now, based on production growth, the Model 3 should hopefully move up at one or two spots next year. It's about 30,000 units for the year behind the Hyundai Elantra, but I think the bulk of the growth in Model 3 sales next year is probably going to come outside of the U.S. as the Gigafactory 3 produces more and more cars for China, and Fremont Factory here has a full calendar year to send more Model 3s to Europe, Australia, and other territories, because remember that uh, the right-hand drive deliveries for you know some of Europe and all of Australia, they only started mid-year this year, so... I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure the Model 3 can move up a ton on that list as, uh, as the, you know, they're currently supply constrained with batteries. 
Uh, but you know, those the other uh, th- those other factors should certainly help it to grow internationally, which is you know just as good as far as Tesla is concerned. Um, plus, demand should only increase a bit everywhere else in the world because the standard range plus uh, will also be out there for the entire calendar year of 2020 after it was only introduced a quarter of the way into the year this year in 2019. But the point is, big congratulations are in order for the entire Model 3 team at Tesla. This is a tremendous achievement. It's, it's a great milestone for electric vehicles to crack the top 10 of cars, period, sold in the United States in a year. And again, of it is of particular note, in my opinion, because the company is still supply constrained, <laughs> certainly not demand constrained, supply constrained on the battery side particularly. So that is awesome, awesome stuff. Next up this week, some more Cybertruck features being hinted at by Elon Musk this week. In response to Lex Acevedo, hi if you're out there, Lex, who wrote, Can the Cybertruck pump the HVAC to the truck bed when the vault cover is closed for sleeping and camping? And is there access from the second row? Also, does it have the bioweapon defense filter system? Elon did reply to Lex saying, Yes, probably and partially. So you can kind of interpret that in a number of ways. I, I think the, I don't think the yes, see, I, it, it's tough. I think the yes is just sort of a general yes. And then the probably and partially are to, to the two specific things. But uh, again, that is the question, which bits was Elon responding to there? So again, I suspect it was the first two parts about pumping the HVAC into the vault and access from the second row, and that he didn't address bioweapon defense mode because it's very possible that the answer is no on bioweapon defense mode. Because remember, the three and the Y don't have bioweapon defense mode as lower cost vehicles. And the Cybertruck is a lower cost vehicle too. Um, But you know, it's the bioweapon defense mode seems to be something that Tesla is reserving for its premium vehicles. But if I do have that correct, it's still interesting. You know, the the fact that you can at least somewhat regulate the temperature of the vault and there may be partial access from the second row. You know, I'm not entirely sure what that'll mean. You know, I'm kind of having trouble picturing it as I'm sitting here thinking about it. But hey, more utility is always a good thing, particularly for truck buyers. Now, if you want to look at it the other way that he was saying uh, yes to pumping the HVAC into the vault and uh, partially for access, or rather probably for access to the, to the second row uh, to the vault and then partially on bioweapon defense mode, that would be better. Certainly that would be better than the way I am interpreting it, but it remains to be seen. Nevertheless, Uh, Good to have a few extra details there on the Cybertruck. Finally this week, and speaking of Elon Musk's tweets, we got a little bit more out of him this week. In fact, courtesy of a friend of mine, Tesla Owners Club Silicon Valley President John, asking Elon for an update on MCU upgrades for MCU One owners. Elon saying, quote, The MCU upgrade is not recommended in my opinion. It isn't needed for full self-driving, and the cost is about $2,000 for limited entertainment improvements. And he later added, It costs a few thousand dollars and is more complex than a board swap. A bunch of connectors and antennas need to change. We can improve the speed, meaning of the, of the speed of the screen and the interface. We can improve the speed a little with software optimization, which might be enough. End quote. Now, I have to respectfully disagree with Elon on this one. If you have been in an MCU 1 car, and then you've been in an MCU 2 car, there is a pretty darn noticeable difference. Now, I'm not at all saying that the MCU 1 is bad, but it the MCU 2 is noticeably zippier when you're navigating your way through the interface and, and around the screen. Plus, a lot of the new software features aren't available 
to MCU 1. Even if they tend to be of the more fun variety, the fact is you're not getting them on MCU 1. Uh, my friend Eric from Tesla Inventory followed up, jumped into the thread and said, the MCU, uh, oh, sorry, that was the, uh, uh, oh, darn it. You know what? I copy and pasted the wrong darn thing. But anyway, Elon <laughs> did, did reply to Eric as basically Eric sort of challenged, you know, politely challenged him. And Elon said, this is quite a thorny hardware problem as there are many different versions of the MCU and autopilot computer and the supporting hardware. The cars last so much longer than phones. Hopefully we'll be able to upgrade MCU 1 and AP 2.0 in a few months. Oh yeah, Eric was was uh, mentioning not only MCU 1 but the fact that he he that he paid for full self-driving on his MCU 1 AP 2.0, not 2.5 car. So you know, he was asking about both of those things and Elon acknowledging that, again, the, the MCU upgrade, hopefully coming in a few months, and being able to upgrade to full self the full self-driving computer and hardware suite from Autopilot 2, which was promised by Tesla back in the day. So uh, look for two grand uh, if you're interested in that MCU upgrade, and uh, you'll be able to hopefully get it done fairly painlessly, either via a remote mobile service or a, uh, a service center appointment. And if you're curious, well, if you're thinking right now, I've got an MCU one car, do I want to spend two grand on that? I mean, I obviously can't answer that question for you, but I would say, I guess I'd phrase it this way. If you plan on continuing to hold on to your car for a long period of time, the fact of the matter is you use your screen every single day that you're in your car. Every, it is the, as you all know, it is the way to interact with the car and interface with the car. So as, as a day-to-day quality of life upgrade, I, I think it's probably worth it to do, to, to take Tesla up on the MCU upgrade when it does finally become available. All right, well, that's everything I've got for you news-wise this week, heading into the, the big holiday week. I'm, I'm not sure how busy next week uh, and even the week after are going to be. I have contingency plans in place for this podcast if it does end up being slow news weeks. But, you know, I, I fear that every year, you know, because I, I haven't taken the holidays off from this podcast. I don't, as you know, I, I do... Uh, pretty much don't take any time off from this podcast, but, and every year it seems like I've got enough to talk about. So fingers crossed, there'll be some fun Tesla topics for next week's show and the week show after that. But I will be on top of, uh, of the news, uh, no matter how much of it <laughs> or how little of it there is. All right, stick with me. I'm going to come right back and do your awesome phone calls in the ride, the lightning hotline right after this. It's Ride the Lightning Hotline time. Your questions, your comments, your discussion topics as they pertain, of course, to the world of Tesla. If you would like to participate, which I wholeheartedly welcome and encourage and invite you to do so, you can call me anytime in one of two easy ways. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question, please, please, please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many calls each week as possible. And you can email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can do the same thing, 90 second or less message, and just leave it on the Ride the Lightning Hotline voicemail, which you can call anytime toll free at 1 888 989 Eight, excuse me, 8752. Again, that's one triple eight nine eight nine tsla And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Let me talk now to Kaz from San Diego calling in about premium connectivity. Go ahead, Kaz. Hey, Tesla family. This is Kaz down in San Diego with some thoughts on the premium connectivity. I know it's not pleasant to pay for something that was once free, but to put a positive spin on this, 
most of us pay for subscriptions that we don't get a whole lot of use out of, or it pertains to one simple thing in our lives like Spotify or Netflix. This premium option gives us multiple multimedia streaming outlets and the chance for the hundreds of thousands and soon millions of Tesla customers and supporters, the chance to directly contribute to the growth and prosperity of this company. $10 to support the company that's pushing us into the future far faster than anyone else. This will generate hundreds of millions of dollars in the coming years and a number that won't grow linearly, but exponentially. This lets us all more directly be a part of that mission to accelerate the advent to a sustainable future. Just some food for thought. Take care. Thank you, Kaz. I like that bigger picture optimistic way of looking at it. Another good point to be made here, which I honestly, I failed to account for in last week's show, and some listeners commented to me about, is bandwidth costs. We don't know what Tesla's arrangement with AT&T is. Do they have a blanket long-term agreement that locks in Tesla's costs? Or does the deal stipulate that Tesla pay more and more per X number of cars it delivers? You know, in other words, the $10 per month for premium connectivity might not end up being a ton of profit for Tesla at all, but may instead be largely allocated or maybe even entirely allocated towards covering their bandwidth costs with AT&T. I would love to find out more about this from Tesla sometime so that we have a clearer picture of it. Maybe that could be a good topic for uh, the next earnings call since they did, you know, just initiate premium connectivity. Well, they announced it and they're going to initiate it in Q1. So we'll see. John from Chicago is up next, wants to talk Cybertruck. John, you're on the air. Hey, Ryan, this is John from Chicago, longtime listener and first time caller. Your podcast is amazing, and I tell my friends to subscribe, so keep up the good work. On that note, I'm a fellow P3D Plus owner, and as I'm sure you can agree, the look of the red brake calipers are absolutely gorgeous. With that in mind, I have a reservation down on the tri-motor Cybertruck, and was wondering your thoughts on if this is in fact the performance variant. And if so, do you feel this will have similar red calipers as all the other performance models do? Hoping that's the case, and like you had mentioned a few weeks back via even Pavlauko, aka the Mad Hungarian, that the 35-inch off-road tires may not be the default, so hopefully we could be able to see those beautiful calipers. Love the podcast, keep up the great work, and keep being you. Thanks. John, thank you for the kind words. Uh, this is a good question. First, though, uh, it's not the tires that will allow you to see the red calipers, of course, it's the wheels. And it's going to be interesting to see if the Cybertruck has more than one wheel style or more than one wheel size. The ones that are on the prototype appear, uh, appear to be a kind of aero wheel. You know, they've got the, the covers on there. My gut tells me that no, we will not see red calipers on the tri-motor Cybertruck. And here's why. This truck is breaking all other Tesla conventions. No badging, no paint, etc. So I really think they are all going to look the same outside of a probable color of interior. Although I wouldn't actually be surprised if they end up only offering black for the seats in this thing. But as always, I reserve the right to be wrong. Thank you, John, for your call. Dave from San Francisco is up next uh, about an autopilot camera issue. Go ahead, Dave. Hey, Ryan. Dave from San Francisco. Just wanted to say that it was really uh, fun to meet the man behind the voice yesterday at the San Francisco meetup, uh, San Francisco Club meetup. Anyway, the question I had for you uh, was about the uh, left side pillar camera that four of us experienced a issue with yesterday and as we came to that meetup. So I just wondered if you thought any more about that and if you have a theory as to what was going on. So anyway, great to meet you and thanks for the podcast. You are a rock star. Likewise, Dave, it was good to meet you as well. Now, Dave is referencing something that I was going to get to later in the show, but let's go ahead and talk about it now. On my way to the San Francisco Tesla Club meetup on a cool but not rainy Saturday morning last weekend, 
I got an error message on my screen that I had never seen before, and it said, left door pillar camera blocked or blinded. Clean camera or wait for it to regain visibility. So as soon as I got to the meetup, I got out of my car to look at the camera, and Dave walks over to me, and he says he got the same thing. Now, there did appear to be some condensation in there, which I admit, I don't know if it's normally there or not, because I've never had the message, never had a problem, I've never looked. But a couple of people at the meetup also had the same issue. And it continued to display that error message intermittently on my way home when it was like 59 degrees and sunny. So I went on the Tesla Motors Reddit later that day and there was a thread and sure enough, others have been having the same issue as well. And here's the thing, everyone that's experiencing this recently had gotten the 40.2.1 software update. So it would seem that this is a software-related bug of sorts, although the, the actual condensation inside the, the housing there has me a little concerned that maybe it's not, but the, you know just the, the timing of it, the fact that it's all hit everybody at once since this update leads me to think that maybe you know there's some way that Tesla can address this as a, as a software thing and that we didn't all in mass have a uh, you know a, a, a panel like a, the B pillar cover failure all at the exact same time. And, you know, we have seen this kind of thing before where an update will introduce some sort of minor issue with autopilot or with something else. But thankfully, the issue doesn't disable autopilot entirely, but uh, it also, when it's when it was happening, it wouldn't either do or prompt automatic lane changes. So here's hoping that Tesla squashes this issue in the next update. Thank you very much, Dave, for calling in with this. And I just remembered... Uh, there's something I completely forgot to cover in the news. How just shame on me. And it was one other tweet from Elon. And it is this. I'm just going to mention it now. Hopefully, you're still listening to this part of the show. <laughs> Elon had uh, saying just uh, what yesterday, uh, Thursday, Tesla holiday software update has a full self driving sneak preview, Stardew Valley, lost backgammon, and a few other things. So let me just start. The backgammon should be pretty obvious. Uh, Stardew Valley, Google it if you're not familiar. It is a really cool video game that's uh, a very deep video game. This is not a beach buggy racing to, you know, pick up and play for two minutes kind of arcade style get in, get out racing game. This is like a full on adventure, like sort of uh, farmy, adventure, uh, kind of Zelda-y a little bit, but it's it's a big game that you can spend dozens of hours in. So pretty cool that that is going to be coming to the Teslas before, you know, right here as sort of a Christmas present, holiday gift. Uh, now, the, the big thing there is full self-driving sneak preview. What does that mean, number one? Number two... Are you going to have to have hardware, the hardware three, the full self-driving computer in order to take advantage of it? I would imagine the answer to that is yes. But yeah, I don't know what a sneak preview, that's just, a, it's a strangely phrased thing. Like how do you, how do you have a sneak preview in live code, it, you know, running in the fleet, unless it's, unless it's going to maybe show you what the the stoplight and stop sign recognition is going to do but not actually do it yet like so maybe it'll show the lights on your screen the chain you know the red red yellow green like the changing of the lights and sh and show stop signs i mean there there was a a stop sign 3d polygonal model found in the code base not that long ago i didn't cover it last week or the week before whenever it was cuz it was a little insignificant at the time i thought there wasn't a lot to say about it but with this, that might that might make a ton of sense. So stay tuned for that. You might we might get something uh, a really fun update here sometime in the next week. Uh, anyway, that aside, aside. Thank you, Dave, for calling in again. It was very nice to meet you. Dave was very nice. It was, uh, great to chat with him at the club meetup. Josh from Chicago. 
uh, has a uh, w- has basically some uh, a winter suggestion for the cars. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, Ryan, it's Josh calling from Chicago. Long time listener, first time caller. I am an early Model Three rear wheel long range owner. I had a Tesla Mobile service here this morning to swap out my tires for the winter. A shout out to Lewis. He was my tech, super nice guy and really helpful. Um, I took this opportunity to ask him about a feature request that had been on on my mind quite a bit and I was surprised I had not uh, read or seen anything about it. For us Model 3 owners in cold climates, the sticking door handle can be a real problem. I know it's been a hot topic, especially since the first winter when the Fudsters were all over Twitter about it. Um, But it does seem to be a small design flaw because essentially water or condensation gets in the door handles and then it freezes. You've probably actually noticed this yourself uh, when you get a car wash or when it rains that there is water in the door handles um, for a little while afterwards. The fix that Elon tweeted out previously was to turn on um, the heat and precondition it. This does seem to work. However, it uses a lot of energy and also doesn't always work if you don't give it enough time to warm up completely. What I suggested was to add a button to the to open the doors via the control section of the app on the phone. Um, obviously, this works because this is a software-enabled door open versus mechanical door handle. Um, Lewis seemed to think it was a great idea and was surprised he or nobody he had talked with had thought about it, especially since technically it seems like an easy fix. Anyway, wanted to pass it along and spread the word and hopefully get this feature on the road roadmap. Thanks for everything you do. Talk to you soon. I love that, Josh. Thanks so much. I am more than happy to help you shout that one from the rooftops here via the podcast. I know that people from various disciplines at Tesla do listen to this podcast, so hopefully the right person hears it and can raise it in their next features meeting. Cheers to you, Josh. Lance from Richland, Washington is up next, uh, wants to talk Cybertruck as well. Go ahead, Lance. Hey, Ryan. This is Lance from Richland, Washington. I love the podcast. I've been listening since episode 170. For some reason, this is my first time calling in. I absolutely love my Model 3, and amongst the myriad of reasons why I chose a Tesla, a large part was due to the infrastructure provided by the supercharger network. I recently reserved a tri-motor Cybertruck because of its 500-plus mile range. I own a 26-foot travel trailer that I intend to pull with the truck. Knowing what happens to my Model 3 when I put a bike on top, I can only imagine what will happen to the range of the Cybertruck while towing. My concern is that even if my range is halved to 250 miles while towing, I'm likely going to need to stop at a supercharger. The majority of locations are of a back-end style. I'm not too keen in having to disconnect my trailer in a nearby parking lot, then drive to the supercharger and go through the reconnect process every time a charge is required. I hope Tesla has thought about this. But I would like to see more wide lane pull through superchargers start to be constructed. I'm curious what your thoughts on this are. Thanks. Bye. Lance, thank you for calling in, and I could not agree with you more. Teslas that are towing something are going to become a lot more common at superchargers once the Cybertruck hits the streets, and Tesla is going to need to do their best to account for that. As you know, Tesla doesn't own very many of the supercharging sites, hardly at all, in fact. So they might be limited in what they can actually do, but hopefully, as you said, they are already thinking about this and are going to be designing future supercharger sites with this in mind. Uh, By the way, congratulations on your Cybertruck order, and happy holidays to you, Lance. Quentin from Palo Alto has a really, really fun, almost a trivia question here. Let's uh, let's hear from Quentin. Hi, Ryan. Quentin from Palo Alto calling. I just had a fun question, sort of that uh, Model Three and uh, configurations. I was wondering when I am eagerly Tesla watching, if you will, on the roads, um, if anyone knows what the rarest configurations are for the Model Three. So, like black with aero wheels and black interior would be common because that used to be the uh, standard configuration. But what about ones that are much less ordered and much less rare to see on the road? Anyway, just wondering, thanks for all the help, and I'll be receiving delivery of my Model 3 this week. Thank you. Bye. Quentin, I love questions like this. So for Model 3, you can narrow it down, and I think I know the answer. You've got a few candidates. First, the mid-range Model 3s didn't last long. So you could look at those 
and then go with the least popular paint option. So perhaps a silver mid-range three with, uh, let's call it the 19-inch sport wheels, since they're a bit less common than the default 18-inch aero wheels. Next, I think there would be two performance Model 3 candidates here. One, a silver performance Model 3, since silver was discontinued not long after the performance cars started shipping. I tell you, I've only ever seen a few uh, silver P3Ds on the road. But what I actually think the answer is, and again, this is just my best guess. I don't have access to Tesla's data to uh, definitively prove it, is the Obsidian Black Metallic Painted Performance Model 3, probably with white interior. Uh, white interior is a bit less common than black because it costs more, and the Obsidian Black Metallic Paint was introduced on the Model 3s right about when the first, just a hair after the first, uh, or maybe right at the same time, as the first Performance Model 3s were delivering, and that paint color was pretty darn quickly discontinued. So that's my guess. An obsidian black metallic performance model three with white interior. Uh, Quentin, let's play this game again some other time, maybe in a slow news week with the model S and the model X, because those cars each have some pretty rare unicorn kind of configurations as well. And by the way, Quentin, uh, congratulations on your delivery. Marty from Hollywood is up next with a security question that I can hopefully answer for him. Go ahead, Marty. Oh, yeah, Ryan. This is Marty from Hollywood, California. Um, I was wondering with the Cybertruck, very strong, probably the strongest vehicle ever made, if it were ever, if it's possible for Tesla, if need be, to remotely shut the truck down from being used, if it were to be used for some you know, form of uh, uh, as a weapon or something like that, if they actually could shut it down remotely. That's it. Thank you. Yes, indeed, Marty. Tesla does have this capability should law enforcement request it. I believe they are the only ones that can do so, though. Uh, this has happened every once in a blue moon with car thieves, and they uh, they absolutely do have the power to shut the car down in an emergency situation. Great question there. That is a really good question. Haven't I hadn't even thought about that in a while. There was a Model S theft of, gosh, this must have been several years ago that, that made the news that was a, a story like this. James from Sudbury, Ontario, uh, has a few Cybertruck questions. So go ahead, James. Hey, Ryan, I've got a number of questions and comments for you. I'll try to keep it under 90 seconds. Number one, have you seen any 360 video out there of the inside of the test rides of the Cybertruck so we can get a better feel for the interior? Number two, any talk of the windshield wiper patent being used in the Cybertruck, not the laser version, but the magnetically coupled one? Number three, in our Model 3, we have aftermarket rims and rubber for winter uh, without tire pressure monitors, so we have a warning reminding us that our tire pressure monitors are failed. Uh, can that warning be disabled for the winter season? Number four, my son falls asleep in the car all the time and I find myself at supercharges and want to play video games or watch Netflix with audio. Do you think they might consider allowing to play audio through Bluetooth in the inverse of the typical layout where audio streams from your phone to car's audio system and instead stream to headphones? Uh, just a few comments. I've been listening to your podcast since the Elon interview and need to give you props on your work. You provide professional level quality every week, which is un unmatched by anyone out there. I'm happy to see te Tesla reward you for that by giving you e interview time. Um, it is weird to have listened to you this long and not know what you look like, at least until the interview I saw of you uh, by Norm from Tested. Up until then, you'd just been a voice to me. Uh, just a comment on the Cybertruck. It's definitely not what I was hoping for, but the truth is I need a truck. I have an F-150 and my wife has a 3, so I have a taste of the Tesla experience and can't wait to replace my truck with a Tesla. I would drive on the Oscar Mayer Wiener if Elon only gave me that as a truck option. That's because buying a Tesla is buying a part of an evolving experience, one in which we're helping to train possibly the most mature self-driving AI collectively as we just go about our normal life. The nerd in me really enjoys that aspect. Anyhow, looking forward to hearing your comments on any or all of my questions. Thanks for time and keep up the great work. Wow, James, you are right. That was quite the lightning round phone call right there. So here we go. First, I am surprised now that I think about it to say that I haven't seen any 360-degree videos from the Cybertruck test rides back on Reveal Night. Go figure. 
Uh, second, I am presuming that Tesla hopes the magnetic windshield wiper patent will allow them to not have a big windshield wiper arm on the production Cybertruck. Same, by the way, for the Semi and for the Roadster, I'm imagining as well. Third, I'm not sure about that one, I'm afraid. But finally, your idea about streaming audio to Bluetooth instead of just from it to account for sleeping children in the car, I think is a really good one, I think. I, I would love to see that. The best you can do for now is to go into your audio settings and drag your sound field over the driver's seat rather than the center of the car. You know, that's not going to shut off those rear speakers, but it might minimize the noise in the back seat a little bit, at least. Thank you very much for your call. Two more calls this week. Our penultimate caller is Josh from Niagara Falls, reacting to Alex from last week about Teslas and car rental companies. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, Ryan. It's Josh calling from Niagara Falls, Canada. I just finished listening to episode 228, and specifically Alex's phone call at the end of the show about car companies using Teslas. My only concern is if the general public that aren't Tesla fans don't know how to properly drive a Tesla or too much about them, would car rental companies be spending way too much time training people on how to properly drive the car? That's why, like, I've rented a Model 3 a couple times through the app Turo, and that works out because, one, I'm a Tesla fan, just waiting for my Model Y to be here. But other than that, I love the show and all you do for the Tesla community, and thanks a lot. Have a good day. You make an excellent point there, Josh. I hadn't really considered that, but you are absolutely right. There is a learning curve with a Tesla, not a difficult one in my opinion, but just one that takes a little bit of time. And the last thing a rental car company probably wants to do is to have to answer simple questions about how things work. I mean, I suppose they could offer a quick tutorial at the pickup, but even that would add up over the course of a day. And yes, Turo is a good public service announcement for folks. Uh, I've heard plenty of good words spoken about them. I don't have any personal experience with them or affiliation, so uh, just passing along. I mean, they're, they're a crowdsource thing, kind of like uh, Airbnb, but for cars. So your mileage may vary, if you'll <laughs> pardon the phrasing, but it is a good option, seemingly, if you want to make sure that you do get a Tesla when you travel. I actually had a lot of calls and emails this week all suggesting Turo. Uh, I want to specifically mention Ron from Nashville, James from Dallas, and Kyle from Georgia, who all called in about this same topic and all mentioned Turo as well. Thanks, Josh. Finally this week, last but absolutely not least, Mark from Idaho, speaking of Turo, just booked a Model 3 via Turo and uh, wants to ask a question about that. Mark, let me see if I can help you out. Hi, Ryan. This is Mark Jennings from Moscow, Idaho. I am love listening to your podcast. I've just discovered it recently. I um, have just booked a Tesla Model 3 through Turo in Tucson, Arizona, uh, coming up here in January 9th and hope to experience Smart Summit in the wild. Uh, however, the renter indicated he could not enable Smart Summon for me as that would require him to give me his Tesla credentials, which due to understandable security concerns, he doesn't want to do. Uh, now, do you or does any one of your listeners know of a way for the renter to enable Smart Summon on my Tesla app for the duration of the rental? I, I don't yet own a Tesla, and I would just download the app for the rental. Uh, or, or am I limited for the Tesla Model 3 owner to show me Smart Summon in his driveway? Um, thank you, Ryan, um, for your podcast every week. I look forward to them. And I uh, look forward to your response. Thanks again. Bye. Hey, Mark, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, unfortunately, the app is the only way to use Smart Summon. And it's understandable that the owner doesn't want to give you his or her Tesla login and password. So while it is certainly good of you to ask if there's an alternative, I think your best bet probably to try and be a little constructive on this call is indeed to ask the owner of the car to let you check it out with him or her at either your pickup, or your drop-off. I hope you enjoy the car, and I hope you have a wonderful trip. Thanks to everybody that called in this week. 
Uh, got to as many calls as I could, plenty more. Again, those will go into the monthly Patreon bonus episode, uh, which is there for those that support at a certain tier on Patreon. I'll mention that later. But if again, if you want to call in, I encourage it. I welcome it. I thank you for doing so if you do choose to do that. And you can call in in one of those two easy ways that I mentioned at the top of this segment. Stick with me. No, I'm not. I'm, uh, <laughs> stick with me, though. My goodness. Somebody's ready for bed. It's me. Uh, I'll be right back with the pro tip of the week and a few parting thoughts right after this. Well, I saw my first Performance Model 3 with the new dark gray 20-inch wheels today. They are finally delivering those here in the Bay Area, clearly, which makes sense because now we're at the very end of the quarter and they're going to deliver you know, the cars close to the mothership right near the end of the quarter since they don't have to transport them. It was a midnight silver metallic with those dark gray wheels so that the wheels match the body reasonably well. And they look really good. I dig them. I think they they look real nice, and I think they're going to look very good with most of the, what, five paint colors. And I think they they look real nice with the white. They look pretty good off the Midnight Silver Metallic. Uh, I'll be curious to see them in real life off of the red. I do like them, uh, the the dark gray turbines on on the red S. So we'll see. But yeah, if you are going to be a new Performance Model 3 owner coming up, you are probably getting those dark gray 20 inch wheels. Now, before I play you the pro tip of the week, you know, you guys know, I try to keep it very positive on purpose on this podcast because number, I mean, primarily it's just that I am so enthusiastic about Tesla stuff. I love it. It brings me a lot of enjoyment. It's so much fun for me that that's what this podcast is. It's an expression of that. It is a reflection of that. But I have to rant for a second. It's not about Tesla, though. It's about the state of California. It's about our state government, and particularly Caltrans, uh, the, the, those, the department that manages the Department of Transportation that manages the roads. So if you remember, uh, gosh, that would have been, two, I guess, two months ago now when I told the story of how I blew out two tires, the front right and the rear right tires on consecutive potholes that were in line with each other, merging out of the airport, heading 101 North here out of the the San Francisco airport. And I told you at the time that I, you know, that I submitted a claim for this, which they allow you to do. And I supplied a Google Drive link to my dash cam evidence that clearly shows the potholes thanks to this sort of night vision, you know, brightening enhancement that automatically happens on the the sentry cam, the dash cam footage. So I thought I had an open and shut case. I was billing them for $800, which even though I put four new tires on, like I told you, because the the two remaining ones were pretty low, but I billed them for the two tires. It's 800 bucks on, on, you know, on the performance model three. That's, you know, tires all up. It's 400 with mounting and balancing. And uh, so I've been waiting, waiting for a check. Like, all right, how much are they going to, you know, they're going to hopefully reimburse the whole thing. Well, I got that check, uh, the, not the check. I got the, a letter back. And as soon as I opened the letter, I knew something, w- it was not going to be good because there was no check inside. Instead, a letter that read as follows. Dear Ryan McCaffrey, the state of California Department of Transportation has received and reviewed your claim of $10,000 or less. Due to the amount sought, the California Department of Transportation is authorized to accept, accept in part, or reject in full the claim. See Government Code Section 935.7. Based upon the California Department of Transportation's investigation, the California Department of Transportation has determined it is not liable. Therefore, the California Department of Transportation is rejecting your claim. So basically, what that almost literally translates to is we have the power solely to determine if we are at fault through our own investigation of ourselves. We have determined that we are not at fault. Go home. Bye bye. Uh, I am real not thrilled about this because there was just nothing. I mean, it was, 
you've you've saw my footage. If you saw me on uh, my Instagram, uh, it's on there. You can see it very clearly, uh, clear as day, even though it was at night. And this is just like for them to reimburse zero dollars and zero cents is just I mean, I don't know if they're not at fault for that. What are they at fault for? I mean, it's just insane. I believe me. And I know a lot of people are you might be thinking, oh, well, California, there you go. It's no, I love living here. Believe me, I'm you know, I know it's not perfect. There there's plenty of issues, but I, I love living here. But this this is just by just absurd in my humble opinion. And uh, now they do say <laughs> you have six months from the date of this notice, uh, the date this notice was personally delivered or deposited in the mail to file a court action on this claim. Well, I don't have the the means or the time or the expertise to sue them over $800, but I wish I did. I wish I were a lawyer or knew one because it's just... I wish I could just drag them through, through court and, and present my evidence to a judge. I don't know if that's even how it works, if there's a judge or what, you know, what kind of hearing or something it is. But like, look at the dash cam footage. Look at the front camera. Now look at the side camera and you can see the tires blow out. You can see that like the puff of air as the tires blow out. Oh, this infuriates me. And thanks to nasty potholes, I'm out $800, no fault of my own. Uh, and again, I know I'm running 20 inch tires and I accept the, the added risk that those entail. But in this case, you know, I, I just do not think I should be responsible for, for what, for, uh, the, the cost of those tires. But anyway, how about a happier note? Let's, <laughs> let me talk to Sarah in Cleveland, who is a newer owner, uh, of, of a Tesla and has, a pro tip that everybody can use if you're not using it already. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Tesla fans. My name is Sarah. I'm from the Cleveland, Ohio area, and I have a pro tip, I think. Um, I'm a newer owner, so I apologize if this has already been um, discovered, but I know the the windshield wipers can be a little cumbersome to deal with turning off and on um, on the screen, but if you hit the stock on the left side that operates the windshield wiper washer fluid, um, the button on the side, just press it in once, you will get one wipe of your windshield wipers without the fluid coming out. So just my pro tip. Thanks so much. Sarah, thank you. As we head into the rainy season or snowy rainy season or slushy season, wherever you are, whatever you've got. This is definitely a good one to remind newer owners of because, as you noted, Sarah, the wiper controls are a bit unconventional on the Model 3. So maybe you're already using this one, but in the in the off chance you're not, this is an extraordinarily useful little shortcut. Thank you very much for your call, and that will bring me to the end of another episode of Ride the Lightning. 229 of these, actually more than that because there were a couple of special episodes as well, but... Uh, I want to mention just a few friends of the podcast, starting with Abstract Ocean. Visit abstractocean.com for all sorts of awesome Tesla accessories, whether it's tempered glass screen protectors, whether it's upgraded lighting kits for the interior of your car or the trunk and frunk as well, whether you're looking for uh, a little uh, you know vinyl wrap kit in a different pattern or color for your center console, in your Model 3, which of course is so prone to scratching and, and fingerprinting. So all kinds of stuff there. And you can use the coupon code RTL Podcast, all one word, RTL Podcast at checkout and get 15% off of your first order at abstractocean.com. So I have not heard any update from Jeff at Immaculate Reflections, so I presume there is still at least one more, if not the two more he mentioned to me, uh, one or two more of the full-body uh, paint protection film mega discounts out there. So again, if you're taking delivery here at the end of the quarter and uh, you're either taking delivery here in the Bay Area or you're going to be in the Bay Area and that is something that is of interest to you, you can contact Immaculate Reflections via their website, irdetailing.com. Uh, he also does, of course, uh, paint correction, paint, uh, or rather ceramic coating in addition to 
the paint protection film packages. So uh, you can check out his work on Yelp at yelp.com slash immaculate reflections or Instagram where his handle is immaculate underscore reflections. Love Jeff. Wish him the best. He has taken great care of me. And at this point, I've heard from a lot of Ride the Lightning listeners that have gone his way. And everybody has come back very impressed with both Jeff as a human being and Jeff as a detailer. Uh, PureTesla.com slash RTL. If you need a one-stop turnkey solution for your dash cam slash sentry mode, you just go over there, PureTesla.com slash RTL and just choose which size kit you'd like. That's $49 for the 128 gig uh, gigabyte kit, or $69 if you want to step up to the 256 gig. It comes fully formatted for Tesla cam, just plug and play straight out of the box and into your Tesla. Works with Mac or PC when you go to review the footage. They ship anywhere worldwide, including free shipping, anywhere in the United States. So that's puretesla.com slash RTL. Uh, And then there's Jada as well. The Jada wireless charging pad makes an awesome gift. Although I guess by the time you hear this, you're about out of time to make it before Christmas. But hey, there's always, (laughs) there's there's no bad time to get a, a, a Qi wireless phone charger for your own Model 3 or someone that you love. But yeah, if, uh, if you're in the market for the wireless charging pad for the Model 3, which works fantastically, uh, and or you're in the market for the USB hub that'll go fits nice and flush right in your Model 3 as well, either or both of those, please use my referral link for that, which is getjada.com. That's Jada spelled J-E-D-A. Getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. I would sincerely appreciate if you would use that link when ordering. And finally, if you're not already subscribing to the podcast, I know I've got a lot of new folks out there from the Cybertruck event or people that are just finding the podcast as they maybe take delivery of a Tesla or are considering it. Uh, You can subscribe to this podcast. That costs zero dollars and zero cents. All it means is that the podcast will push out to you automatically each and every time there's a new episode, which is, of course, every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. And that way you don't have to remember, oh, it's Sunday, I should go download the new episode. It'll just download to you if you subscribe, which you can do via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, which, of course, TuneIn is in your Tesla. So, yes, this, this podcast is available natively there. And then I'm on YouTube as well, just as in audio form. There's no video there. But if you prefer to consume the podcast via YouTube, it's there as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the show, but if you want to reach me via email, you can do so at the email address teslapodcast at gmail.com. If you'd care to follow me on Twitter and or Instagram, I'm the same handle on both, DMC underscore Ryan. And I think that'll about do it. Ah, other than the Patreon, it is, you know, it's, uh, I've done, what, 50, well, I guess 52, it's, it should be 52 episodes this year, every week. Uh, if you feel that I have earned your support, if you'd like to support my efforts on the podcast, I would sincerely appreciate your consideration in doing so. And the way to do that is through Patreon, uh, which is basically, it's a, this, if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a, it's a service it's kind of like Kickstarter, but in an, on an, in an ongoing basis. You're sort of kickstarting me every single week for any amount of money you choose. Uh, there are different tiers there, though, uh, sort of pre-selected tiers that give you different little bonuses uh, that, that go up as you, as you move up in dollar value. But you can find all that information on my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Podcast. Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And I want to now thank the Patreon producers. These folks 
are kindly supporting me at the tier that gets their name shouted out each and every week in addition to some other little perks and goodies. So thank you very much to Pete White, Wolfgang Obergen, George Cassioppo, David Brander, Jonathan Wales, Alexi Heft, Logan Willis, Michael Lester, Robert Maracle, Jason Chalukas, Joe Edgel, Tim Hyde, Lars Hoffman, Lawton from Chicago, Peter Chalet, Rome Strack, David Vakil, Ulrich Lassa, Luke A., Eric Randolph, David Nondahl, Jerry and Mary Smith, Brian Hope, Bill Royko, Lyle Austin, Joel Sapp, Dory and Steve Guberman, Michael Waddle, Daniel Grummer, Jeremy, Tesla Owners Taiwan, Jeremy Harris, Rob Brewer, Ron Lee, Chris Konesnik, John Cody, Matthew Wright, Aaron Appleby, Charlie Gillespie, Kaz Barnes, Neil Weaver, David Perella, Sunil Joseph, Dennis Peak, Scott Gillis, Will Stedman, Evie Tricity UK, Stig Mickey Jensen, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, Richard Folkers, Matt Kalen, and Trenton from Myrtle Beach. Thank you all very much for your continued support. Uh, now, I guess the one last thing I wanted to mention as I was kind of moving through the show this week, uh, I will be in Arizona for part of the holidays there uh, for the, the second half over, you know, sort of from the end of December up through a uh, little bit past New Year's. What, I don't know if any of my Arizona listeners out there, would you guys want to do a meetup like at a like an in, at an in and out burger or something? I don't know if that would be of interest to anybody. I, I don't presume to to think that I'm important enough that anybody, you know, should drop what they're doing and come meet me. I mean, <laughs> what, the, the person you hear on this podcast is the the person in real life. There's no sort of um, showbiz version <laughs> or anything like that. But I don't know if if if, if Arizona people are would be interested in getting together at any point. I am going to have basically nothing but free time while I'm there. So if there's any interest from people, I would be happy to to arrange something. But anyway, I guess you can email me if you're interested in that, teslapodcast at gmail.com. Uh, next week, I'm going to do my 2020 New Year's predictions for Tesla. And I'm going to go over last year's and see how I did from my predictions last year. So that should be fun. We'll see what other Tesla news pops between now and then. Plus, of course, I'll have uh, more of your awesome phone calls to get to as well. So for a, oh yeah, she's out cold now, for a sleeping Daisy the Boxer puppy, of course she found the one blanket on the couch. She's got snuggled right up to that thing. That dog knows blankets. For a sleeping Daisy the Boxer puppy, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Thank you so much for spending your time, your valuable, valuable time with me each and every week. Uh, this is Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. Happy electric motoring, my friends. H hopefully uh, safe electric motoring for, for all of you, including me, on my trip to Arizona and back. Here's hoping nothing, nothing bad happens to any of us. Hopefully our Teslas and their occupants will stay safe and roadworthy. But uh, happy electric motoring to all of you, and I will see you one more time in 2019 next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.